Welcome to the Radiant Life Podcast. I am your host, Tatiana Kuto, and I am a master mindset coach, and I'm obsessed with empowering you to live and create your best life possible. If you're looking to uplevel your mindset, life, happiness, and success, then you are in the right place. My goal with this podcast is to help you see the potential within yourself, to be able to break the limiting beliefs and habits that are holding you back, and to help you feel inspired to get clear with who you are in order to create the life you desire. Thank you so much for listening. Now let's get into today's episode. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Radiant Life Podcast. Today's episode is super special. I had the privilege to interview a good friend of mine, Miss Lissa Scott, and we go deep in this episode. She opens up a lot about things that she honestly hasn't even opened up to many people in her life, sharing what the phrase what if I don't means to her and how it completely radically changed her life. We talk about building that intuition muscle, how to like tap in to hearing what your true self is telling you and how she overcame fears, people's judgments, and so much more of her story. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. I hope you enjoy. All right. Hello and welcome to the Radiant Life Podcast. Today we have a super special guest, Lissa. Lissa is someone I have met within my business coaching program and her story is super inspirational. I fell in love when I first heard it and we're really talking into a saying that drives her and her life, which is what happens if you don't. So welcome, Lissa. I'm excited to have you. Yes, girl. I'm so happy to be here. Um, Yeah. Meeting you has been such a gift and I feel like we instantly clicked and I instantly was like, Tatiana has some really good things to say. And I'm sure that your podcast listeners will retweet on that one because (laughs) your podcasts are bomb. So I'm just super stoked to be here. Thanks. I know for a backstory to the listeners. So yeah, we met um, in a business coaching program. You joined like about a year ago, right? Um, I joined in July. Yeah. Okay, cool. And we physically met in October And it, that's when I was like, Ooh, I vibe with her. I love her. When I first met you, I remember I was like a little intimidated because I was like, (laughs) I couldn't tell. It was like rough around the edges, the tats, which I love tattoos, but I was like, where is she at? But like meeting you, I just instantly connected and I was like, Oh my God, like, I love you. Yeah. I think like I can be intimidating because I have, well, first of all, my face is like super angular. So if I'm not smiling, I kind of just have like a fierce look just because of my facial features. Yeah. But then I think as soon as you see like how hard I love people and how big I hug you and like easily I laugh, I think some of that melts off. Um, And I honestly had the same thing with you is I was like, oh, she's got that Hispanic sass. Like, let's go. Like your aura is so confident. And I was just like, oh my gosh. But again, same thing super smiley, super warm. Our hug was like massive. We're like, Oh my God, get over here. Like, it's so good to meet you. And then all of that melts away. So it's super powerful. So true. It's a great reminder that like people with strong personalities like us, sometimes people Mm -hmm. feel threatened or don't think that, I don't know what assumptions are made, but if you really just take the time, like we have the biggest hearts. And that's what I really learned with you. I was like, no, like we're going to vibe like, and big personalities can vibe together. I think a lot of people have that. Oh yeah. And I was like, no, we were especially, talking. Especially, yeah, especially like in that space where in our crew, it's not, the goal isn't to be the same. The goal is yeah. to like celebrate who you are and be a developed version of yourself, right? So um, I, I think that everybody has their shadow side and their, their like sunshine side, as I like to say, but learning to, hey, everybody's on a growth journey here. Everybody's really just trying to learn to play to their strengths, right? And being yeah. in that room of like, you and I are super different. Allie and I are super different. Courtney and I are super different, but it's like, it's celebrated. So that container was super powerful too. Heck yeah. That's the power of surrounding yourself with like-minded people who see you for who you truly are. Like I was just so, we were both so authentic, so vulnerable when we first met. And this was the first time we met. We only had like, you know, group coaching calls. So just a reminder, your people are out there. You go find them, be yourself and you will attract them because that was like a huge life changing weekend. And so glad we got to connect. I'm so glad to have you on here. So the topic of today's podcast is like, what happens if you don't? So tell me a little bit. Well, tell me, let's start off with with you sharing who you are, where you came from, what you do, a little backstory before we like really dive into it. Yeah, girl, for sure. So 
I am Melissa Scott. I am originally from the Philly area. I am now a nomad that is traveling full time with Zavi D, who I met the same week I met you yeah. in person for the first time. <laughs> same same connection. Um, but yeah, so basically, I travel and I coach. I do mind body spirit coaching, and the form that it usually takes is personal growth and business growth. Before that, I'm going to tell the story in reverse order so you guys can see how it added up to that. Um, yeah. Before that, I was doing health and fitness coaching. And then I realized like, Hey, I want to talk about more than back squats and macros. I want to talk about who you are as human and what your soul desires, because you were placed on this earth for a reason. There is a mission in you that needs to be unleashed. And if you are not living in step with that, it can be very hard to be satisfied and happy in all cylinders of your life. And so I truly believe that a life well lived is firing at an eight to 10 on all cylinders, not a 10 in one and a six in another, or a 10 in one and a four in another, but having that balance and understanding that we need to move all aspects of your life forward, not one super speed and the rest are lagging behind. So that's the mind, body, spirit piece of it. But, um, the health and fitness thing was cool before that I was coaching CrossFit in person and working restaurant job. And so that evolved into the online coaching space and me wanting to be location independent and really be able to decide what I charge. Because if you've ever personal trained in someone else's gym, you have limited control. It's not that you have no control, but you ultimately owe them a piece of what you make. Um, and rightly, rightly so you're using their space and their equipment. Um, but that wasn't the world that I wanted to live in forever. And I certainly didn't want to open a gym and be stuck in one spot. So before that, before I was waitressing and CrossFit coaching, um, I was actually working a nine to five and I quit that nine to five with no idea where I was going to end up, but I was a graphic designer and marketing, uh, gal who did events and branding and social media. And so the skill set naturally lended itself to, having a leg up in the online space, I won't say it made the online space easy, but it definitely made it easier. And that felt like a natural progression for me. Um, went to school, thought I was going to be an English major, you know, <laughs> then I thought I was going to be a communications major, but I always like thought, Hey, when I was a child, when I was like four people would say, what do you want to be? I would flip flop back and forth between author, artist, and teacher. And I would argue that being an online coach and needing to create content, but also teach but also interact with others is kind of a blend of those three. And so oddly enough, um, those skill sets have kind of always been there, but yeah, I just figured I would tell my story reverse today instead of the other way around, give it a little oh. fresh perspective. Um, so I hope that made good sense to you guys, but that's the short answer. <laughs> I love it. And I think those who are listening, if you ever listen to my story, very, very similar, like the nine to five wasn't aligned got into health and fitness. I feel like health and fitness is the true door and gateway for discovering yourself because, okay, you're taking care of your body. Then you naturally start taking care of your mind because you're feeling good. Mm -hmm. You're feeling your body in all these different ways. And then like, I mean, I see it with my clients and my friends and just like, whoa, what else is out there? Who truly am I? And that's like when you and I, our coaching comes in, because it's like finding yourself can be confusing, (laughs) like unknown territories. Yeah especially if you're surrounded by people who aren't doing that. So if, if it's a foreign concept to you, you're truly in uncharted territory and it can be hard to know which stone to turn over, so to speak. And Tatiana, with what you just said, I resonate extremely, extremely well, which is why health and fitness is still part of the mentoring that I do when needed, right? When someone needs that, I still can kind of pull that out and we can absolutely talk about that. Um, but it's the tangible, it's the physical realm. So it's easiest to access because you can see it, feel it, measure it, touch it. Um, look at it, learn from other people. Like I know we're all physically a little different, right? We have different body builds and we have different like metabolisms and things, but more or less a woman's body is a woman's body. And so I can learn from you and it directly applies to me. Um, and so I think that's super interesting. And then you go into a little bit less tangible, right? You go into your thoughts and then like your spirit's even less tangible. And so I think it can be a really good access point. Or as I like to say, the lowest hanging fruit is like, you Mm. can reach up and grab it. And so it gives people, like you said, a gateway into oh my God, there's personal development and growth and I can actually change my reality, whether it be my physical being or my internal being. So super freaking powerful. Hell yeah. I'm so glad that we've both been on that journey because I know it's absolutely changed our lives and our clients' lives. Yeah, and for it's sure. It's getting better. So tell me about this, this saying that you say and you kind of live by, like what happens if you don't? When did that start? What does that mean to you? Yeah, so I was, there's a couple of things that, that you need to understand before I go into this. Number one, there's, uh, and I'm an audio learner. So what I say to myself is the most convincing part of what I do. 
I learn by hearing. So whatever I'm telling myself over and over again is extra powerful. Number two, I love to drive and listen to music. And that is primarily where I heal and where I have had breakthroughs and light bulb moments. Some people it's the shower, some people it's the gym, some people it's in conversation. Um, and the other piece is that I, I live by a series of mantras. And so this is just one of about five or six that are really close to my heart. But this one, what happens if you don't was a saying that I had no words for for a long time, but felt. And so I was listening to morning coffee with Rick Alexander, my favorite podcast. Um, and he said, when the, when the thought of what happens if I don't do this becomes more powerful than what happens if I do, right? That's when kind of something, something breaks. There's a tipping point. And so I heard him say that I was driving on the back roads one morning on the way to my job, my nine to five job. And I thought to myself, oh shit, <laughs> what happens if I don't like, what happens if I stay here? So the, the synopsis at the time was I, I knew I had gifts. I knew that I could I made for more was just tugging on my heart every day. You're made for more. You're made for more. You're made for more. On average, I was talking to five or six people a day total. And I was like, impact super low, right? Then the level and depth for those conversations was very minimal. It was pretty surfacy. So I was, again, like my impact super low. Like I'm not getting to the deep place and the deep conversation that I want to be in with people. And so that saying, what happens if you don't, I didn't even know what the thing was. I just knew that that wasn't it. Do you know what I mean? Like what I was currently doing wasn't me living at maximum potency, but at the time I didn't even have the language for it. So what happens if you don't became this, this guiding question for me it was like, okay, if you have gifts and what happens if you don't tap into them, what happens if you don't share them? What happens if you don't happens if you don't, and it became this loop of thought. And so like, personally, what happens if you don't, I'm just going to break it down into a couple categories here so that people can see how I was using this question. Cause maybe the question is also relevant to you guys. Um, what happens if I don't physically is, Hey, I do fitness. So I don't have to figure out what happens if I don't like very tangible again. Right. Yeah. I don't want achy, creaky, cracky, dependent living. I want, I want an able vessel. And then professionally what happens if I don't is like okay so I'm just gonna sit at a desk for 40 hours a week and not play in the sun and not be able to travel like having eight days of paid vacation and then being frowned upon to take more days off is a very tough situation to be in and one that I was really not okay with um and so that was super tough like what happens if I don't like nothing good the answer to fitness what happens if I don't nothing good professionally if I stayed where I was at what happens if I don't move nothing good right And then taking that a a level further is when you look at some of your spirit, some of what you feel like you're here to share, you may not necessarily know, like, you know what, I need to teach people X, Y, Z, but you have this hunch in a direction. Is this making sense? Yeah. Like you have this hunch in a direction and you're like, what happens if I don't follow that pool or lean into that direction? It's like, okay, if I have something to teach and I'm not teaching it, who am I not impacting? Who's not getting that message that needed that message? And when I started to think like that, I had already left the nine to five, but it was like, what happens if I don't build this business and just start? Who cares if I have to start with the physical realm? Physical realm, I know, right? And later when I started to work with Graham, it was like, what happens if I don't? And that shift was, what happens if I don't shift out of fitness and into this mind, body, spirit stuff? Again, nothing good. Like I had things inside me that um, when I went through some unique life experiences, I say unique. They weren't even unique. They're super common. My parents got divorced. I had anxiety. Uh, My dad died when I was young. Other people have gone through that stuff and I still came out on top. I still feel Mm -hmm. like I came out. I'm super blessed. I'm not saying by any means that I didn't have a divine hand on it. And like, it was all me. I'm not saying that at all. But when I look at that season in my life, I'm like, how did I go through all that and still come out on top? Because I have every reason to want to pull the covers over my head and be a bitch, right? And that's not the, the end result. How, how did I come out of that with drive and passion and zest and compassion and excitement? What, what was that toolbox, right? And so I went back and started to extract some of those pieces and was like, oh, what happens if I don't share this? Somebody else is going to get stuck in depression, anxiety, bitchiness, negativity, right? So even if you help one person or two or three or four or five, was it worth it? Absolutely. It was worth it. Yeah. It's like that compound, that domino effect. I literally heard a quote today saying like, 
the people who come out on top happy still and positive who have who shouldn't be who have gone through the trenches those are the those are god's people and you don't mess with them because they you know they make the best out of it um and I think another like term that you're saying in case not everyone's fully grasping is just when you have a situation in your life, a belief, whatever happens, what is the benefit of keeping it or staying that mm. way? And what are the consequences? You're yeah. unhappy, you're unfulfilled, you're not, you know, you're miserable. Like what are the so consequences? what happens if you don't let go of that belief? Yeah. Right. Or those what bad happens habits? if you don't shift that habit? What happens? If, and yes. And this is what I'm saying is it has manifested into these deeper and deeper areas where at first it was just like, what happens if I don't leave this job, which is a pretty surface question, right? Uh But it has gone so much deeper and I still continue to apply it, which is why I'm sitting here sharing it is it's been five, no, four years of me asking that question and it still hasn't become useless. It's still such a good question. I'm like, oh, we need to talk about this. So yeah, it's like those uncomfortable conversations you have to have with yourself. I'm going through something too. And I'm like, what happens if I don't do this? And I'm going to stay mm-hmm. in the pattern that I have been for What years. happens if I don't heal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nothing good. <laughs> it's no. like, there's these obvious things where you don't even know, you don't even have to know what you need to do, but you need to know that you can't stay where you're at. And so yeah. my mom used to always say, it's okay to be where you're at. It's not okay to stay there. And I was always like, oof, that's love. Ooh, okay. That's like a it's okay love. to be where you're at, but it's not okay to stay there. And so that's real love versus the enabler, right? Mm-hmm. The enabler says, just stay there. Validating so. your story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of hurts my head because it's so profound. <laughs> yeah. Because so many people in our society just do that, right? We just, we comfort you. We tell you what you mm-hmm. want to hear versus being like, no, and encouraging you in a tough love type of way. Like, are you going to stay here or not? How can I support you to get out of this situation? Because the truth yeah. hurts, but the truth is where breakthroughs happen and growth happen. Yes. And there's yeah. no rush, you know, it's like, you can baby step your way forward. It's, it's so rarely in life are things like cold Turkey, where you take three big giant steps, right? Mother, may I take three giant steps? Usually God's answer is no. <laughs> He's like, how about half a centimeter today and half a centimeter tomorrow? And how about yeah. we just continue walking toward the light every day? How about that? And it's an infinite walk. Like yeah. you could still take a giant step and not be there. So I think like, that slow, steady progress and that slow, steady chip away kind of energy is so much more powerful and steady Mm -hmm. than the like person who runs three giant steps and then takes four small steps backwards, right? It's like that progress regress and that energy is so exhausting. Yeah. There's no rush. There's no rush. Really. You're going to get there anyway. Yeah. So you mentioned like kind of tapping into like, you just, you knew you felt like in your gut and your intuition was there anything that you did to kind of build that connection with yourself? Cause I know some people struggle with like, well, how do I, like, how do I get a gut feeling or intuition? I don't know. Any mm-hmm. like tips or anything around that, that really helped you hone in on like, other than that question, like, no, my, this is telling me I need to do this. Oh yeah, for sure. So for me, that was a strong connection to God. Um, for someone else that might be a strong connection to self for someone mm-hmm. else that might be a strong connection to source. Like they might be a little bit more vague about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally believe that God is a loving God and wants a personal relationship with us and that I can tap into him for wisdom whenever. And the second that I think that I have to come up with the wisdom is the second that I crumble. Right. And so just like I outsource my wisdom to Jesus. Right. (laughs) So it's like super awesome um, to have that, but whatever you have, I think it's, it's really important to go back. We all had that intuition at at birth. It was a birthright. And so if you feel like you don't have it, it's really important to go back and say, where do I feel like I lost that? Where did it get cloudy? Cause that's all that happened is there's clouds over it. It's there. Mm -hmm. So as a child, I can remember being in some very unique environments, like biker parties where people were doing (laughs) cocaine. And like, I remember there was this one party. I don't even know why I'm talking about this, but it seems relevant. There was this one party where someone had a pet snake, like the owner of the house had a pet snake, this huge thing. And me and like two other kids decided to take the snake out of the cage and like walk out into the driveway where there was like a live band and like motorcycles. And we were like, dad, dad, like, look, we got the snake out of the cage. Well, apparently this is like a boa constrictor. And so we weren't supposed to be playing with it, right? It wasn't like a little tiny thing. It was like this huge ass snake, like six feet long. And they were like, so um, intoxicated that they, they weren't concerned. They were oh, like, wow. oh, this is awesome. The kids got the snake out, blah, right? 
And so there was that uncomfortable feeling in my belly of like, oh, something's wrong, <laughs> right? Like you're in this energy. Yeah. We all have that. If you can remember back to being four, five, six, seven, eight, I'm sure there was something in your life. Even if it was just, hey, I made fun of someone at school and now I'm lying to my teacher and saying I didn't. Like, could be something so little, or I looked at something I shouldn't have. Like, did you snoop and find a Christmas present? Or I remember one time being in fifth grade and like we found our, someone printed something off the printer and it was like, who was in what cabin for camp, when we, which was supposed to be a surprise. And we like found it, right? And we had to like decide if we were going to tell or not. Like, that feeling of true honesty was there and you knew when you went against it. And so like, where did you lose that? Going back, there's probably some healing to be done if you feel like you lost that. So, Uh oh, I lost it or I turned it off when I was a certain age or was like sexual shame is another big one. Like sometimes you know things are wrong and you you, like press down and press down and hide and hide and hide. And so like, where did you start hiding or where did you start suppressing or where did you start feeling that uncomfortable feeling in your stomach and ignoring it? Right. And so like, there might be healing to be done there, but, um, I feel like I kind of kept mine. I'm not saying perfect, like, right. I'm not an angel. I'm a human being. So there's obviously times where I've yeah. pressed it down, but I feel it right between my rib cage. Like that's where I feel it. And I remember being, um, so when my dad passed away, I was 15. And that was the thing that was like, are you going to believe what you say you believe? Or are you going to pretend like you believe it? Right. And I mm. clung and I leaned hard into my faith. I was like, you know what? I believe it more now, not less. I did not shift into like, if God loves me, why did he let this happen? I stayed fully in. I was praying to grow. And a week later, my dad died. And I was praying so hard. I was circling in prayer which is when every time you think about it you pray about it right away just a phrase oh. um and so it was like god grow me god grow me god grow me like every probably 30 minutes or an hour for a couple of weeks and my dad was ripped from my life suddenly if that's not going to grow you nothing will so i almost felt like in a weird way god heard my prayer and i was like this is just too weird super unsettling yeah but but he did grow me and so i was like okay if this is how you're going to grow me like grow me. I spoke at his funeral in front of 600 people, 400 of them covered in denim and leather bikers, pagans, warlocks, people he dealt drugs to. Like, I mean, a rough crowd, a rough crowd that did not want to hear the message of Jesus. Right. And I stood up and I talked in front of them and was just like, you guys are all worried about me and I have peace and here's why. And it was so wild to get up and, and pretty much preach in front of this really rough crowd. Um, And it was just, it was just crazy. So really like leaning into that. So then a couple of months later, um, I was at a, I can't even call it like a Bible study. It was a fellowship at Mm -hmm. someone's house. There was no pastor there. It wasn't church organized. It was a couple of kids. Um, They lived in a log cabin. They had bonfires every week and we would sing worship songs. It was super laid back, like Hey, how can we pray for each other? Hey, what are you guys going through? More just like a space to connect and talk and have some s'mores. And so like be, being outside and listening to music, right, are two of my big like healing things. So that was a thing that brought me tremendous healing. And I remember the one night we were praying over each other and the, this girl, Kate, she was one of the kids who lived at the house, came over and she put her hand on my stomach. And she was like, you have a fiery pit in your stomach. Like you are leading from a force that is not your own. And that was the first time that someone else had called it out, right? Like, boom, right? And so I was like, oh my God, I think you're right. Like, I really do lead from here. When I met Zavi, I felt pulled from my rib cage. When I, you know, when I know I'm supposed to do something, I feel it here. And it sometimes manifests as nervousness and like right under my ribs. And sometimes it manifests as excitement. When I feel it there, I know it's it's the true thing. Not when I feel it up in my head, right? And so it's like so, so interesting even looking back and, um, you know, I was in church a couple months ago, really weird service. It was like the first time I went to church in my hometown in like three years, my mom and, uh, they were doing, what's it called? Mm, I can't remember what it's called. They pray over you if you want praying over me. And this, this woman again, kind of, um, you go up, you accept prayer. You don't Mm. tell them anything. You tell them your name. They start praying. And usually what they're saying is spot on and super relevant. And you're like, what the heck? So <laughs> what, what happened was I went up and um, a kid my age, I actually knew his sister from high school, super cool. He's, he has his hand above my, the crown of my head mm-hmm. and he's praying over me in Hebrew. And so I don't know what he's saying. And he stopped. 
and he looks at me real, real, real happy. And he goes, I, I don't know if this is relevant, but God said he wants to release something through you through song. He's like, should you sing? And I said, no, no, no. Simultaneously that t- two weeks before I was praying on, should I do music therapy with a coach? I said, okay, there's my green light, right? I was having all this hip pain. And I knew it was emotional because it can't be physical. Like I had done so much mobility, so much eating healthy that I'm like, it's not physical pain. It's an emotional pain being held in my hip. So I'm like, okay, yep, he does. So I started working with this music coach, shout out to Brady. Um, he's the spiritual DJ on Instagram. If you guys are like curious about what the heck I'm talking about, but um, the woman behind me, so he was praying in front of me and the woman behind me goes, you're on fire and the devil does not like it. And so again, that was the second time I heard somebody call it out that in my core of my being, she was on the small of my back and he, she, Kate had been on the front of me, but I'm like, oh, that's like, it's so weird now that it's, you know, 10 years later and people are still saying the same thing. So I'm not saying that I have any more power. It is he within me. It's not mm-hmm. me, right? So it's important to note that, but just when you... I don't know when you have it don't cloud it and if it's yeah. cloudy go clear it because it is so powerful that is so, so so true it's like when you start listening in even if it's uncomfortable like it's guiding you it's how I felt when I moved, quit my job and moved to Florida it's just hmm. the more you connect with yourself the more you connect to God or what it is you do you know believe in as higher source like it you're strengthening right you're strengthening that bond and for me I personally believe I personally believe it's society that Mm-hmm. creates this stigma that allows us to break um not break but like get untouched with our intuitions as children we're so intuitive I just want to go yeah. play in the sand why because I want to and then you meet a great friend like you're so intuitive mm-hmm. but then like as you grow up you know bullies or fear of judgments or if your parents or teaching or teachers telling you no you're doing it wrong you need to do this when really like your soul like is telling you no I want to do this like right and that's I think when we truly lose touch at least for me but I'm trying to like, I literally, I feel, I say it all the time. Like I'm a product of, I was a product of society standards and expectations. Like mm-hmm. I wanted to dance, to act, to sing, to help people, to what all these things, but no, that that's like not possible for me. And I lost that. Then I got into pills, like, you know, Adderall, anti-anxiety, depressants. And when I got off of that, that's when I started to reconnect with myself. I've started to reconnect with God. And that's when I started taking the cloud my- out. Mm-hmm. For me, that was mm-hmm. it. Like it was, well, fear mm-hmm. of judgment, fitting into mm-hmm. society standards, corporate. But when I really took those pills out, cause they were fogging the fuck out of my brain and myself. Like I was zombie. Like I actually just made a post on it yesterday. Oh, uh, that was so powerful. If you guys haven't read that post. Whew. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm Tatiana, creating- will you describe the picture that was on that post? So if people are like scrolling back, they can see yeah. the picture. It's a picture. You're in a tube me. top, right? Yeah. I'm like in a pink, I'm on pink in a lot, but I'm looking in the mirror. Like it's a picture yeah. of me looking in the mirror and it's, it's, I have, I'm creating a podcast on it to really share my story of the doctors in the pharmaceutical industry, because mm-hmm. I do have a powerful message, but I was, Unreal. I was, I do, I was getting toyed with cause it's money. It's all money. Right. And so when mm-hmm. I finally was able to come out of that, that's when I, and come, you know, praying, getting into podcasts, I started building that intuition and God literally just kept sending nudges hints, like inklings, like just people, situations in my life. And I was just like, how can you not listen to the signs? You have to learn to trust and to give in like versus the what ifs, what if it goes wrong? Well, what if I stay here? Right. Kind of bringing it back. What if I don't, what if I don't? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so really just tapping in. So that's just my, my story on that, you guys, because everyone has a different way, but you guys know, I think if you're listening to this right now, you're like, shit, I know those gut feelings they are talking about. I know that situation for me. Yeah. Sometimes you're right. It's right in my like gut, like right between my rib cage. And like, it's unsettling sometimes. Sometimes it's like we, the bottom of my sports bra, literally right yes, there. Yes, exactly. And mm-hmm. you label it sometimes as nerves, fear, anxiety, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Right? Or then my heart starts beating fast and I'm just like, let's transition to my second question is, you know, the fear. Well, yeah. well, what ifs? Cause we always just want to think of what if, it, what if we're wrong? What if, it, what if, right? Like, how did you overcome maybe some fears that came up, even though your intuition was telling you, but like maybe people, I don't know where people tripping in your ear. Why are you quitting your job? Why are you investing this? Like, how did you navigate those maybe thoughts, fears, people's opinions? Yeah, for sure. So one quick little note is you said sometimes it's uncomfortable to listen to your intuition. It's almost always uncomfortable to listen to your intuition. Yeah, thank you. For like sure. if you're not nauseous, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> but it's nauseous down here in your stomach. It's not in your throat where like you get that Ooh. lump in your throat. 
that's true nausea the nausea that i'm talking about is like the flip-flop it's like the yes. pre-roller coaster feeling right it's your truth um, that literally happened to me saturday and i won't share why but like something that i'm overcoming my hands yeah. usually feel shaky yes, too i was yeah. shaking i was like i was like i'm gonna get sick and i was shaking dance it off you guys dance it off i jumped around i shook it off because i knew overcoming that was what I needed to do. Cause I've learned mm-hmm. that, but like, if you feel that don't fear it, don't judge it, but let's, yeah, let's go into like how you overcome that fear for yourself. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to go into some of the heavier stuff before I go into some of the job stuff. Okay, the job yeah. stuff feels so light compared to mm. like some of the other stuff. So I'll talk about job stuff first with the help. Um, the job stuff, the fear, the societal like norm that breaking that whole thing. Right. Um, I made a pro and con list, right. Pros of keeping this job. It's secure in quotation marks. I've learned the secure jobs aren't, they're not even secure. You just like tell yourself that they're secure. You can oh, be yeah. let go at any time. Look they're at not any more secure. How many people yeah. lost their jobs? They were never secure. I think a lot of people, a lot yeah. of people learned that this year, um, unfortunately. And I'm not saying it's not tragic, but it is reality. So Mm-hmm. Your secure job isn't that secure anyway. <laughs> it's secure in quotation marks. Um, the other pros were that I could get health care. Like, okay, but we have a sick care system in this country. Mm-hmm. And I was a healthy person. And the reality is if I'm going to go to a doctor, I'd much rather go to an integrative medicine or a holistic doctor anyway, which insurance does not cover. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to pay out of pocket or I'm going to pay out of pocket. Cool. Got it. Um, the other per quote unquote to having a corporate job was like, Oh, well you have 40 hours a week of steady work. And I was like, yeah, 40 hours a week of steady work at a low rate. And they pick my hours. So, okay. And then, um, another perk would be like, I got gear discounts and whatever. And I'm like, okay, cool. I could be making three times the money and not need the discount. So there was like a lot of like little things like that. Of course, that there's your family and friends. They're like, well, you got a college degree. Like, what do you mean? You're not going to use it. No, I'm still going to use it. I'm just going to work for myself. Completely Mm. different. But we seek the external validation because we did the external thing, right? Most of us didn't like feel deep in our core, unless we're a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, something you absolutely have to go to school for, that we had this deep desire to go to school. Most of us feel that that was projected onto us and that we should go to school. So we went to school kind of a thing. So I'm not saying that everyone's in that boat saying, I'm going to go with 75% of people are in that boat. So we went to school to make other people happy, to make our parents happy, to do what we were supposed to do. And so um, it's hard for a lot of people to let go of like using their resume, right? They were so proud of their GPA and their, their college degree that it's like, what do you mean I'm not going to use it? So definitely had to get over that. And then as far as money went, I don't know about you, but I could have looked at the next 20 years of, of my career in that field, whether I stayed with the same employer or not. It would have taken me another 20 years to reach the 75 to 100K mark. Oh, I could yeah. have told you that. So unless I was going to be an art director of somewhere or um, a hustler, we'll say professor plus something else, probably wasn't going to make 75 to 100 a year. So I was like, okay, the safe route has, it's safe and slow, right? I kind of knew what it was. The not so safe route, the being an entrepreneur route was, I could go do a service. I could triple my hourly rate. And when you think of tripling your hourly rate, guess what you also get to do? Work a third of the time. Mm-hmm. If I make $45 an hour instead of 15, that means I only need to work one third of the hours. Well, what am I going to do with the other two thirds? I'm going to take a third and I'm going to play. I'm going to take a third and I'm going to work for myself. Cool. And that's what I did for a while was I just like worked a part-time job, flipped some stuff on Poshmark, babysat, um, whatever, you know, I just did what I could personal train and then built this online thing. And so my thought with money was, well, okay, I can always make more money. Like my worst case scenario was, oh, maybe I'll work a 60 or 80 hour week instead of a 40 hour week. But guess what? I won't be stuck in a cubicle and it, it won't be this. Um, I don't even have the languaging for it. And I wish I did. It, it won't be a guaranteed trajectory. Thank God was kind of my thought was, Hey, I might be working 60 hours a week, but not at a desk. Mm. Like I'm going to be waitressing. I'm going to be training. I'm going to be like seeing different people and like more stimulated and less predictable was what I needed. Um, maybe that's a personality thing that I like thrive in chaos or thrive under pressure or thrive under a crazy schedule. But, um, that was the job stuff 
you can always make more money and you know what this path has for you and you don't know what this other path has for you. And so curiosity did not kill the cat. Curiosity like made the cat adventurous, right? Like that, that's how my story has gone. And so as a result, like I'm at that 75K mark right now, two years later, three years later. I'm like, well, that was cool. I got to speed that up. And my work weeks are like 20 to 30 hours long with everything. Not 20 to 30 calls, right? 20, 30 hours total. And I can take unlimited six days, unlimited days off, unlimited like, oh my God, I just want don't want to work Friday. Cool, don't work Friday. Freaking love it. So that was how the financial slash societal stuff played out. As far as conquering the fear within, ooh, like had to bet on myself, right? I had to bet on myself. Like take that in guys. What I'm saying is I left the state save all job and it was like let's see if I can make something better that's a gamble the only way I got through that was you can always go get another job Mm -hmm. you can always go back they won't care that you have a two-year gap in your resume they'll pretend like they care other people will be like what about your resume Mm -hmm. if your work is good and your personality is good and you work hard and you show up somebody will hire you like, yeah. I, I knew I was a hireable person, whether it was perfect or not. I was like, I could always get another job, but I've consistently weighed down the hours that I was working for someone else. Right. It's never, they've never gone back up. They went from 40 to 50 to 20 to 12 to six to none. So like, it was actually, I was getting less of a job the whole time. So interesting how that works. So but yeah, so I don't know that the fear was the fear there was like, I have to gamble on myself. But what was harder than that was the frowning that you get from people. Mm-hmm. They just think that you're out to lunch. <laughs> They're like, this girl, <laughs> like she just quit her job. She thinks she's going to somehow make money from her Instagram. Like, right. You mm-hmm. tell you like your grandparents, your sales strategy. And they're like, what? <laughs> luckily I have some like pretty supportive grandparents but I know there was times that I'm sure that they were like good luck with that honey and like I left and they were probably like oh god (laughs) what's happening yeah um, so I think I just kind of had to like seek out some friends who get it like not rely on slash not tune into those voices as my only form of support Mm -hmm. um because I knew that they were loving but I didn't know if they really truly believed that I could pull it off. So I had to surround myself with some people who really truly believe that I could pull it off. Right. Wow. Somebody, some people who normalize that method of success. And so it's yeah. like we entrepreneur support group, right? Leaders to legends, baby. Like get around 12 other people who are making the same leap that you are and listen to my podcast. The Maximum Potency podcast has 63 episodes of people who have pulled it off. Right. And so I've been collecting these examples of like, look, it worked for this person and this person and this person and this person. We're in, I hate the term paradigm shift, but we're in a paradigm shift. Millennials know they don't have to work 40 hours a week. They don't want. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. And so, like, but, but our parents and our grandparents, all they wanted was stability. Mm-hmm. They wanted predictable. They actually, like, my parents were like, hey, um, Tati, how are we doing on time? I could tell a whole story about this. No, I think we're good. I think we're like, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes in? 35? Cool, cool, cool. So if your parents, if your entrepreneurial spirit, wild spirit, who's looking for less stability and predictability in their life, tell me if this lines up for you. So my, I'm going to talk about my grandparents and my parents. So my grandparents were super chaotic. They were um, people who were showy, right? They wanted to look, keeping up with the Joneses, Joneses mm. kind of thing. Corvettes, cocaine, parties, right? So my parents were raised by people who were operating in chaos. All they wanted was a stable job that was predictable so that they could have a home that wasn't chaotic. That was what they manifested, right? Mm. We, our generation grows up in stable home that is predictable and quote unquote boring. And then all we want is chaos. So while it may not be cocaine and Corvettes followed by stability for you, maybe it is somebody who was an entrepreneur who started a family business, then maybe your dad worked the family business and was very predictable, stable, secure. And now again, you're, you're bringing back that ripple of chaos. It's super interesting when you look at generational stuff and what you were handed slash raised in. Likewise, if your parents were super crazy entrepreneurs who were feast or famine, like um, artists or mm-hmm. event, event people like wedding photographers or caterers or things like that, you often gravitate toward a more stable 
approach for work, a more reliable approach for work, whether it's personal training in a gym where you know there's going to be another client. Like, it's so interesting. So Tati, I'm curious with you, like what, what, what were your last two generations like? Were they entrepreneurial or were they more stable? Because I think oh. that we tend to gravitate to the opposite. Oh, 100% stable. My parents, my mom has been in the job that she got her co-op in, in college, same company. Very stable. Like her internship? Yeah. And then my grandparents, yeah. they like, they immigrated here. So like mm. in the beginning, it wasn't stable. Chaos. Obviously. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. then eventually it went to stability. Right. But my mom saw the chaos. They, she saw them working all these jobs to make money. They just immigrated here. So yeah, that's so funny. Yeah. I'm the first entrepreneur of my family, at least a yeah. couple generations that I know. And like, they were like, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> but that's super powerful because like the immigrant thing is just as risky, if not a million times more risky than the entrepreneur thing. Right. So your, your grandparents pursued an adventure that wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. Then your parents kind of stayed in the stability. And now you're like, again, kind of off charted territory. I think it's super powerful. And I really do think it skips a generation. So I'm curious yeah. if you guys are listening and you have a story that resonates with that. Like, tell us, like, I think it's yeah. the most interesting thing to talk about. So, Never really thought of it like that. Never saw yeah. it in that lens. Yeah. So interesting. It's so yeah. true. But What's I some think thoughts on I fear. Mean, yeah. I mean, when you face fear, you grow. Like mm-hmm. that, it just is what it is. And we're all going through it. And I think what you said, like surrounding yourself with people that support the shit out of you, like you need to bet on yourself. You need to fucking believe in yourself. And you guys, I've said this so many podcasts and it's finding people that believe in you and support you. My number one advice is stop seeking advice from people that are not living the life that you want because yes. they're, just, they're just gonna like, you know, project their fears, their uncertainties. They're like, gonna steer you toward a different reality, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, 100%. like my biggest thing was investing in myself in coaching programs because within those coaching programs, I had coaches who believed in me and supported me. But better than all of like what I've learned from coaches and programs is the relationships I have met. Look at us right now. Mm-hmm. Are you kidding yeah. me? Like, yeah. I would pay thousands upon thousands of dollars go through everything I've gone through just to make the relationships and connections I have because it's gotten me here. I could never do this. The alone. substance, the freaking substance. I mean, when we hang out, it's, you know, five or six or eight or 12 of us, whatever it is, with really nothing in common. We have like, we all like fitness and we all like smoothies, right? It's pretty surfacey yeah. stuff. And then it's like, I find with, with this crew of us, it's almost awkward for us to surface level. Yeah. And so there's that, that, initial day or initial 20 minutes or whatever it is the break-in window we're all like what do we say up here because we don't really know what we talk about on the surface and then as soon as soon as somebody punctures into like here's a real shit right here's a real talk everybody's just like whoosh right like dialed in and so it's like yeah I don't know what the small talk with you about but I could deep talk with you all day and so if you're looking for like substantial relationships get around people who are into personal growth get around people who have the same goal that you do even with athletics and with CrossFit, like your, your buddy who goes to a Globo gym is going to tell you you're fucking insane for doing that workout and that it's too high volume and that your muscles need a day to recover and this and that. And the other thing, when you get around CrossFitters and the, the baseline is so much different, right? That's what I'm trying to say is like everything becomes more possible because you're surrounding yourself with a higher caliber of athlete than mm-hmm. you would at say the YMCA where you work out with your three high school buddies and you're like, yeah, we're just kind of doing this for no reason. Like usually CrossFitters have a purpose behind their training. And that's just an example. But yeah, that's what I'm saying is the entrepreneur, like the person who's paying for a coach has a real goal. Yeah. They're not just like hanging out like, eh, I don't know, just thought maybe I'll learn something. They're usually pretty invested in what they're developing. And that is fire. Yeah. So good to be around. And it's okay to, you know, outgrow friendships and whatnot. I mean, mm-hmm. I still have a friendships, but at the end of the day, oh, yeah. we're, meant to, we're meant to grow and meet people at different stages. Cause who I am now is definitely not who I was in college and definitely not Thank who God. I was in high school. Thank God. I don't know what I was thinking in both of those stages of my life, Yeah, but you know, those it's so true. Like, I surrounded myself with people that just saw where I wanted to go and gave me the belief and support because yeah, these fears might take control over you. But mm-hmm. when you have people who will support you through those fears, because in order to grow, you have to get uncomfortable and face the fears head on. And I'm mm-hmm. still, go- I'm going through one right now, but having friends that support me to let me overcome these fears and let, other than letting them control me, game changer. It's a game changer. You don't have to go through this alone. Maybe you can't mm-hmm. find people, then just hire a coach. You know what I mean? Like yeah. find someone, honestly, I'm not saying that just because I am a coach. I've invested in myself. Find I practice somebody what who's I preach. cultivated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, going off of that is bringing it full circle. What happens if you don't? Mm-hmm. Fear probably is going to take over. The voices in your head or the voices of your friends, of your family, of society that are like, this is risky. This is, you know, not a linear path. This is not guaranteed. Like, if those are the loudest voices in your life, of course you're not going to keep going. And especially you're not going to keep going at the pace that you would if you had the support. So, mm-hmm. like, maybe you do make it through. Maybe you're the anomaly that's like, I know I can do it. And so I'm, I'm going to take that half an inch step forward. But like that community is like 12 people pushing you forward or 10 people or however many are in the crew, like find somebody who has truly cultivated a community. If you're going to hire a coach, focus less on what they know and what they teach and more on who's around them. Who's in their yeah. container. How many people are in the coaching container? Tati, what do you feel like is the best number to be in? Because I feel like at some point the group gets too big and it's not always strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. It's like strength in intimate numbers. I think it really depends on what level you're at um, and how open you can be at. Because I know, you know, our group when we met was like, I don't even know. What was our? 10-ish. Yeah, 10, 15, probably max. I mean, my group program is four and it is so beautifully intimate for beginner levels. And it's mm-hmm. the beautiful, safest space versus like when I joined my first coaching program, I think there was 90 of us. Yeah, and I, I think it was 45 or 50 when I was in. Yeah. yeah. They broke it into subgroups and they gave us accountability partners. And thank God they did. Cause if they didn't, I probably would have, I probably maybe we wouldn't have been here today, honestly. Yeah. Same, like honestly. I'm still friends with those small group accountability partners. So definitely. Yeah. doesn't matter how big of a community, I- it's how intimate. Mm-hmm. And I would have imposter sy- syndrome to my way out of a group of 90. Right. And so it's like also thinking about, Hey, when you're on a group call with people and you need advice, is it easier to share your shit that you're not proud of that you're struggling with with five people or 50? Cause <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's really hard to raise my hand on the call of 50 people and be like, Hey, I'm struggling with this thing. Yeah. No, thanks. No, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. That's a great advice. All group coaching. Are going to as Maybe they do have a bigger container, but do they, do they provide smaller? Is there a pod? <laughs> yeah. Because that's where the biggest growth is going to be. Cause it's the deepest connections. Yeah. So true. Is there coming back to like, what happens if you don't, is there something currently that you are willing to share in your life that you are, you know, in the teeter top of like, what happens if I don't, whether it's business, personal, fun, recreational. Yeah, for sure. So I'm doing, I mentioned it a little, a little bit ago of that hip pain okay Mm. so there's this hip pain happening don't think it's what I'm eating don't think it's how I'm moving because I've been moving the same way for five six years with good form four times a week crossfit like hmm okay scaled back the crossfit pain didn't cease stopped running working out completely actually went and did just the cable machines and some like biking for a month didn't ease up hip was tighter actually believe it or not, what the heck is going on? So as, as I'm wrestling with this in in extreme frustration, a few months ago, I'm like, I'm eating an anti-inflammatory diet. I mean, I'm down in turmeric pills in the morning. I'm like (laughs) not eating sugar. Right. I'm like totally like going ham with the, with the diet, the movement. I couldn't make the movement any easier. If I tried, like, I'm not even feeling like I'm getting a workout in because I'm going so gentle on my body, which for me, I absolutely hate doing that. I want to go all out. So I was like, man, like what the heck, like what gives? So if it's not nutrition and it's not movement and it's not mobility, right. It's not stretching. It's not lacrosse ball. Like what is it? So as I'm wrestling through this, I, I hear Zavi. I don't even think he was talking to me. I think he was in another room on the phone with a client. He's talking about how the spine is a developmental timeline and how your, your tailbone, the bottom of your tailbone is age zero and the top of your neck is age 30. And so Wherever you had trauma, significant trauma in your life is typically where you hold pain. So some of the hardest, most uncomfortable things while my dad dying was super hard. I don't feel that it was unprocessed, unresolved trauma. I felt like I gave it the time and space and healing that it needed. So I look at the ages of like eight to 14, where I was wrestling with things like, why is my dad absent? Why does he not want to see me? What do I have to do to get his attention? Right. That's more like trauma that feels Uh unresolved. I'm like, hmm, L3, L2. Hmm, guess what L3 and L2 and L4 are connected to? Mm -hmm. Your hip flexor. Okay, all right. So I've pinched this nerve in my lower back a bunch of times. My hip is in pain. It's on the fatherly side, 
Okay. I start to heal the stuff with my dad. It switches to my motherly side, my other hip pain in the other hip. I'm like, what the hell? So anyway, I hear this and I'm like, you know, he gets off the call and I'm like, can you explain that to me again? And so he's like, yeah. And I'm like, this is all emotional. This is purely stored emotion that I haven't addressed that is now screaming for me to address it. So what happens if I don't heal? I carry that wound into my, from the left. I carry my wounds into my relationship, which I don't want to put on my partner. Mm-hmm. I continue to have hip pain. I ultimately, if I don't address it, don't get to do my sport anymore, which is also my hobby and my passion. So I'm like, no. <laughs> and then if I can't cross it, how long is it before I can't snowboard and wakeboard? Cause that's my other like happy place. I'm like, okay, so what happens if I don't, the consequences are huge. It is harder for me not to walk, hike, snowboard, wakeboard, or CrossFit than it is for me to sit with my shit. And so I'm going to go sit with my shit, right? Yeah. Um, Zavi hates when I say my shit, I'm going to go sit with my baggage <laughs> <laughs> um, and look at it and give it the space that it needs. And I'm going to accept that it's not a linear journey and that my head pain isn't going to go away overnight, but I'm going to commit to working through my stuff because if I don't work through my stuff, A, can I even preach what I'm preaching Uh with integrity? Probably not. And B, if I don't heal, if I don't grow, if I don't process, like I'm going to stagnate. It's the whole, like, if you're not living, you're dying thing. Like I'm not going to become a better coach. If I'm not going to become a better coach, why am I even coaching? Right. If I'm not committed to progressing, then I'm committed to regressing. What happens if you don't list? And so I've been sitting with that question a lot around something I really don't want to address, something I've worked really hard not to address, right? It's been mm-hmm. like, I don't know, eight to 27. It's been like almost 20 years of me, like kind of not addressing it. So I'd way rather address minor hip pain than a hip replacement. My dad had two hip replacements before he was 30. So not trying yeah. to go that route, really not trying to go that route. I think it's super interesting. Um, it's interesting to me that our current medical care is so segmented right? Versus like Ayurveda or Ayurvedic doctors are going to say, Hey, everything's connected. And so putting that lens on of if everything's connected, what is this actually? Um, Mm. I think is super, super interesting. So that's, that's one thing. And then in my business, there's a little bit of a gentler one. And that is like, you know, what happens if you don't, it's taking a very different shape over on the business front right now. Um, If you can't celebrate where you're at, and what you've already created and just enjoy it and not need to be growing in size by 25% every couple of months, right? Because I was in a huge growth phase. What happens if you don't pause and be content is your business becomes something that's going to just going to run you over. Mm. And so like, what happens if you don't, isn't, hey, what happens if you don't pertaining to growth? It's what happens if you don't pertain to contentment, satisfaction and gratitude and nurturing the people that are in your container. Like what happens if you don't become satisfied with this and become grateful for this is you're going to run down this path of like ultimately not being fulfilled and ultimately having more clients than you can serve and ultimately not serving from a powerful place. So like this eight to 10 clients, probably good eight to 10 hours where you have to show up and like really hold space for people. Probably enough. Yeah. Right. Super interesting. Oh, I relate to that one. So true. Cause you know, you're always looking what's next, what's next. Well, what's going to happen if I don't slow down and be grateful for where I'm at now, right? Everything's oh, just yeah. going to fall apart. I love that. Yeah, it's going to disintegrate. You, thank you for opening up about your, you know, your back pain and everything and really, you know, hones into the importance of dealing with your baggage and healing, which is what we do within our coaching. And I know we had an interview last week on your episode, mm-hmm. on your podcast. You guys got to go check it, check it out. It's what's the name of it? It's Mac, what is it? Maximum potency podcast, okay. the maximum potency podcast. Yeah. Tatiana, your episode is going to drop in a couple of weeks. Um, I believe it's episode 66 and we're on 63. So three okay. weeks out right now. Heck yeah. So when that comes out, you guys definitely listen to it. Cause it's so true. Cause we're all energy. And if we're not dealing with baggage mm-hmm. and stuff, like it will manifest into physical. And I, I did, honestly didn't even realize this until you just shared your story. I went through the same exact thing. I, yeah. so the, you know, the spine, like she was talking about, you guys know, some people call it chakras, the meridians, like whatever, we're, it's all interconnected. And if you've been following me on Instagram, I hurt my back last, I don't know, March, April, and that back, lower back pain led into the hip pain. And mm-hmm. Zavi, Zavi D, like shout out to your man because he helped me a lot. Mm-hmm. He did um, with mobility and working through it, but then, you know, it was still there. I got an MRI and they're like, your back is good. Yep. Oh, physically, 
you're not broken. Yeah. There's not my a physical- disc that's rotated. There's not a nerve. There's nothing. Yeah. My physical therapist was like, yeah. and that's when he brought and it did. in. Tati, I think you're manifesting it. Your mindset. What are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the pain? But also what are you not addressing? Again, my right side with that's like your, your, you know, father, men in your life, whatever it is, like there was shit I have to work through, let go, yeah. deal with, heal. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, and you're yeah, like, like, guys, I know it's weird, but it's like, it's not always your posture. You can't always ice cold heat, stim, foam roll your way out of this shit. <laughs> like, yeah, it's so sometimes true. it's like deep. Yeah. And you got to Did you feel like Tatiana, it was a nagging thing. Like it wasn't like, oh, I hurt my back last month. And so it's this, like those momentary injuries. I'm not saying that that's that every injury in your body is like tied to your yeah. lineage and this and that, but that stuff that you've been dealing with for two, three, four or five years, and it's becoming more in your face. That's the stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. For me, I wasn't even full. I mean, I was aware about one part and it wasn't really, really aware until a deeper part until I mm-hmm. got into some meditations and some subconscious work. And I was like, oh shit we got some shit we need to work through (laughs) and luckily my hips have been good my back's been good overcoming the fear of lifting heavy because of that but I'm like I know I'm oh yeah it's that but yeah you're right it's not every injury but it's like you know sometimes like the doctors are like you're good you're doing the mobility work and maybe it's a diet same thing with like weight loss which is why I got into mindset because I was like you you can do the right nutrition you can do the right workouts what's going on what's going on Mm -hmm. Not, yeah, why do you want to lose that weight and why are you so unhappy why did you gain it in the first place I think mm-hmm. that those are all emotional things yeah um, but you're yeah. right and then at the end of the day bring it back full circle what happens if you don't heal what happens if you don't deal with the baggage and traumas what happens if you don't listen to your heart and your gut when something is pulling you for it and so like she said her podcast is all about people who have made it maybe you're listening to this and you're like oh man like oh, this is really uncomfortable, but my heart's been telling me, I know I'm made for more. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, ask yourself, what happens if you don't? What are the consequences? Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me, as we're wrapping it up, just like some quick questions for those listening to really bring it together. What's like one key lesson that you've learned along the way? Mm. Uh, Doing the work is always worth it. Yeah. yeah. You're never going to heal something and go, man, I wish I didn't address that Ooh. ever. <laughs> like so ever. Right. Um, yeah. And then healing, healing is ripping on life guys. Sometimes you got to slow down to speed up, but my whole thing is rip on life. It's, it's really been taking an emotional lens this year of um, rip on life. Isn't always just like getting after it and grinding. Ripping on life is also like ex- expressing what it means to be fully human and really having a full human experience. And so going back to where you said it's, it's usually uncomfortable, right? It's usually uncomfortable to follow that intuition. Another way to say that is like, did society or did someone's projection onto you make you less human, right? Like if it brought you into a sub, submissive state where you were submerging something or not expressing or muting or dampening something, that was probably where you went against your intuition when you had to dim it down somewhere along the line, right? So yeah. yeah don't dim it down, rip on life and healing is part of ripping on life. And it's always, always worth it. That's how I would sum it up. Oh, I love it. I love that. It's so worth it. You guys, I promise you it's painful, but fucking worth it. And I'm going Mm -hmm. through it now too. We all are. We're always growing. It's It's endless. (laughs) Yeah. This is endless. But when you see it, like I'm literally going through stuff right now and I'm literally like, I'm so grateful because I'm going to come out so much stronger out of this, even though it sucks and it pains and it hurts. I'm like, I'm grateful for it. When you can, when you Mm -hmm. finally can like shift that perspective because you've done it before your life radically changes. So love that. Um, final question is like, what are your like top success habits that have helped you grow that are helping you now that you could, um, recommend to those who are just getting started or are in the middle of the journey, whether that's books, tools, routines, tell me about that. Yeah. So, um, from a physical body standpoint, the book own the day by Aubrey Marcus is a big one for me. He basically takes all of those human optimization books and he boils them down into layman's terms. And he says, here's an ideal day. From sun up to sundown, this is what your body would love if you did. Do of it what you can. The goal isn't to do all 17 steps every day. The goal is to take what really serves you. Maybe it's five or six things in the book and implement them. Um, 
really understanding that I needed a morning ritual came from that book and understanding that the repetition was what made it sacred, not actually what I was doing, but Hey body, you do the same four things every morning. This is how I signal to you that it's time to shift from sleeping to doing right. Beautiful stuff in there um, or around like taking care of your physical body emotionally find a spiritual practice, whatever it is for you. I'm not here to say what one right, one's right and the other's wrong. Um, but find something that resonates with you, deeply resonates with you. It may be more like philosophy, listening to Rick Alexander and like thinking about some stuff and being more intentional. It may be going to church. It may be meditation, it may, whatever it is. Um, it's some type of connection to spirit in your day every day. Um, and then a couple little non-negotiables for me are like drink your water, move your body, those are the two that I, without fail, I do every single day. It's like, if I could do nothing else, I'm going to at least do those two things. And that somehow keeps the wheels on. And then sleep is another big one for me. I try not to sleep less than seven hours ever. Um, yeah. I'm like not ashamed to sleep for eight, nine hours. I don't feel any shame in that. I don't think you guys should either. So sleep, drink water, eat like it's basic stuff. It's really, those are my success habits. Do the basics. Know, it sounds so don't overcomplicate it. It's yeah. so true. Um, it is so true. And then the last one is more of like a, a mindset around habits is guys every day lay one brick like we so often try to just build a wall in a week it's like just if you can just every day lay one brick like I will say this about my business every day I did something to move it forward mm-hmm. something whether it was messaging one new person and saying thanks for following me I'm so happy you're here or whether it was writing that post that took 20 minutes it's like what 20 minute action can you take today and every single day this year to just inch yourself forward or show gratitude for the progress you made. Maybe you don't know what to do next. Can you sit in gratitude for 20 minutes and go, look at all these wins I've had this month. Look at all these wins I've had this year. Like one brick, just one brick. That's Simple. Yeah. Such great advice, yeah. you guys. And really just start with one thing, one little thing every day. But mm-hmm. oh, thank you. So many words of inspiration, wisdom. I hope you guys mm-hmm. are feeling on fire to start listening to what you know you're avoiding right yes. now. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and go yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah. How can those listening get in touch with you? Where are yeah. all the platforms that they can find you at? Um, I am primarily on Instagram at Maximum Potency. I am occasionally on Clubhouse at Maximum Potency. And my DMs are really always open. I mean, I have a website, life at maximumpotency.com if you want to be formal about it. But Instagram is where I'm usually hanging out. Um, my podcast, the maximum potency podcast. That's it, girl. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to have to edit that out. Um, thank you so much for having me on today. Seriously. Of course. No, you're good. Thank you guys for listening. We can shift it to that. Um, I don't really, (laughs) thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Tati for hosting. (laughs) I keep you so raw. I want you guys to just know these are just normal conversations. Like I don't. Bloopers. Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I can't wait to watch you grow. Keep asking yourself, what if you don't, everyone who is listening? And thank you so much for being on. Oh yeah, girl. Thank you. Awesome. Bye guys. See you in the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with me and write an Apple iTunes review so I can keep the good stuff coming your way. If you aren't following me already, you can find me on Instagram at Tatiana underscore Kuto. I appreciate you so much and cannot wait to see you in the next episode. In the meantime, continue to shine bright and embrace your radiance.